Um, well, while we're getting uh, the slides up, uh, uh, I want to thank Uli for, for introducing me and, and just uh, mention a little bit about uh, my background. As he mentioned, I'm an infectious disease physician. I've, I've trained in medical informatics uh, locally here. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a local kid. I went to San Mateo High School just up the road from here. So this is my neck of the woods for a long time. Uh, and as Uli mentioned, for the last decade, I've run a, a networking group for physicians, specifically for physicians who are primarily in healthcare IT. So uh, we, we just get together and have dinner. It's pretty informal. But if those, those of you who are physicians who are making your careers in IT and healthcare uh, want to chat with me afterward, we've got a few members here in the audience uh, who have who, who've joined us, uh, and we have dinners uh, about four times a year all over the Bay Area. It's a lot of fun uh, to get to meet other docs who have made that change or incorporating that into the, what they're doing. My background uh, before Hearst was in a, as a, immediately before Hearst, I was the Chief Medical Information Officer for North Bay Health System, which is the major health system for Solano County, about halfway between here and Sacramento. And uh, in uh, Immediately prior to that, I was helping reform the prison healthcare system and doing a lot of the IT and healthcare operations strategy for the receivership that took over our state's uh, prison healthcare. And that is a whole nother presentation that would <laughs> amaze and surprise you to hear what your tax dollars paid for. And uh, I've done a lot of other work uh, with EHR implementations and consulting. I helped design uh, Kaiser's inpatient EPIC system. Uh, I have worked on behalf of Medicare to help primary care offices implement EHRs and uh, have been doing this for a long time. Uh, I, I, I was thrilled to make the transition over to Hearst and to move into more of an entrepreneurial role about four years ago. And uh, my talk today is going to be talking about doing entrepreneurship within a large organization. So uh, within a large corporate organization, in this case Hearst, that's been around for over 125 years. And some of those challenges are similar to those of you who are trying to start new ventures or start something brand new, which is, which is the Silicon Valley religion. Uh, and some of you may be trying to start new ventures within your own organization or try to be entrepreneurial within an established company, established health system. And we call that intrapreneurship. That's what, I, that's what I've specialized in. Uh, many of the things that you, uh, many of the techniques, thinking, approaches that you bring into that are, are similar to entrepreneurship, but you do have to operate within the context of a corporate culture and, uh, and think about things a little bit differently. Can I just really quickly ask a show of hands, how many people in the room here are physicians? And how many people are health professionals that are not physicians? And how many people in this room are uh, not, have no health care training specifically? And of those who have your hands up, are you, raise your hand if you're technology focused? Okay, and how many of you are on the sort of the business side of healthcare? Well, this is a great mix. This is like the whole, the whole, the whole thing here, the whole thing. And and then just across everybody here, how many of you are entrepreneurs of your own sort of new early stage venture, either thinking about or doing? Okay, and then how many people are trying to be entrepreneurial within a larger organization? Okay, a handful. So we're we're it's it's a great mix, Julie. This is a fabulous crew you have here. This is great. Yeah, I've been invited down here many times, and I'm, I'm sorry that it took an invitation to speak to get me here, but I will be back, I promise. <laughs> um, although I no longer uh, practice full-time uh, or even part-time, my most recent practice was doing infectious disease coverage just up the road at the General, uh, San Mateo General, at uh, Cho, former Choke Hospital, uh, where I would encounter Mike from time to time. Uh, uh, Mike's their CMIO. So, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we've been trying to teach an old dog new tricks, Hearst being the old dog and some of the new tricks being the more innovative approaches to new product and new venture development within the Hearst organization. Uh, when I say Hearst, it's the same Hearst that you have been hearing about elsewhere. It's Hearst Castle. It's all the buildings around here that are named Hearst. It's William Randolph Hearst and the San Francisco Chronicle. It's that same family. Uh, Hearst started uh, he, William Randolph Hearst, uh, the one that they made Citizen Kane about, they, he started his media empire, uh, as I said, about 130 years ago, um, with money left over from his dad's gold, gold rush money, bought some newspapers and started the era of yellow journalism and fake news and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're to blame. Uh, and, uh, but 
the company has been very innovative and, and diversified many times over the years. And this is just an example of some of the non-healthcare brands that are owned either in part or entirely by Hearst, which is kind of crazy. So Hearst currently owns 350 companies. Many of them you've heard of. I mean, you've all heard of Cosmopolitan Magazine or Good Housekeeping. You certainly know about the Chronicle here, uh, uh, as well as investments in things like BuzzFeed and Roku, uh, all, all uh, sort of more either moving from traditional media to more digital media, but consumer media, and you wouldn't think that's necessarily healthcare. We have this wonderful headquarters building in Manhattan that was the first uh, uh, major building that was built in Manhattan after 9-11. Uh, um, it's a really cool building. It's very memorable. If any of you get to Manhattan and are on the Upper West Side, uh, everybody recognizes the building. It's a, it's a neat spot. Uh, built on top of the old building. Actually, this is, I, I realize now why I put this slide in. So you've got the old Hearst building that was where all of the original work on the old magazines, the original good housekeeping you know, kitchen where they tested recipes is, was there. And then after, you know, then they decided they needed to expand, so they put the new on top of the old. And I think that's a metaphor for how Hearst works, is building new on top of the old. It's the first uh, uh, LEED certified building in New York. It's pretty neat. Hearst Health is a vertical within Hearst that focuses entirely on healthcare media. And Although most of Hearst is focused on, uh, on consumer-based thing, advertising supported newspapers or ads that go in the magazine or subscriptions to, co to consumers, there's a group of companies within Hearst that are called Hearst Business Media that focus on professional media, all of, all of whom are, all of Hearst companies are focusing on high quality, um, editorial, editorial, editorially sound, unbiased information for the public good. So that's what a newspaper does. And that's what a good magazine does, and that's what a TV station does, and that's what our business companies do. We've got business companies that focus on bond ratings in the finance sector. We've got companies that focus on used car valuations and aircraft maintenance and the transportation group. And then we've got a bunch of healthcare companies. Some of them you may well have heard of or work with. You may even be a customer of. Um, we, we have five US digital health companies. First Data Bank, which is based just up the road here, is the leading provider of drug knowledge. So the patient handouts that you get, patients get when they go get their drugs picked up, or the drug-drug interaction checking that might be in your EPIC system, uh, or the order sentences when you actually order, order in an EHR. Sinks Health, which makes evidence-based order sets and care plans. Many of you have those in your EHRs if you're seeing patients. MCG used to be called Milliman Care Guidelines, which are the guidelines that are used for, um, for authorization by payers to ensure that an admission or a procedure is being done for appropriate medical necessity. That's why, why, why you'll get paid. Your, your system or you as a physician for doing the, doing the operation or procedure will get paid. Home Care Home Base is the leading provider of home care software to home care agencies and home hospice. And then we have MedHoc, which uh, provides software to commercial health plans to help them maintain regulatory compliance and communicate with their insured, insured customers. And then we've got an international group that works out of the UK, uh, working, bringing all of these, these things all over the world. And then an innovation lab, which I'll tell you about in a minute, which is my group. And then there's a, there's a venture arm, which I partner with, but I don't run the venture arm. It's a separate venture group. So uh, don't come to me looking for investment unless you want me to be referred within our, the organization that I work with. Now, we, we have a very wide reach among those companies. Uh, you have it up there. 84% of discharges in, in the US have involved a Hearst product, uh, 4 billion prescriptions a year, 177 million insured individuals have, in some way, have their, their care touched in some way by a Hearst products, and uh, 47 million health, home health visits a year are done on, uh, on a, involve a, home, a Hearst product in some way, either our home care product or the drug products that we use. So that's pretty substantial uh, reach for a company that you think of as being a magazine company. All right, now let's talk about the innovation lab where I fit in. So, uh, the Innovation Lab is a team that was founded by my immediate predecessor, but uh, I've been running this group for four years. 
Uh, our mission is to pioneer markets, technologies, products, and methods that improve and interconnect a person's health journey. That's the, the mission boilerplate. It fits in with the other companies. And we have a broad mandate to try to come up with new products that fit within the Hearst portfolio and the Hearst suite of products, <clears throat> um, which, as you see, is pretty broad. But you know, we, it means that we don't end up doing too much in life sciences or devices or those kinds of things. We don't typically do digital digital products. We're not a services company either. So um, that's are our. Dominated, are you dominated by software as you do that? Yeah, we're. Yeah, feel free to ask questions, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're we're primarily so, software and content. No hardware. We don't get in the hardware space at all. All right. So we've. Over, over the years, we've, we've built and refined a process. Um, and this is the very vague, vague uh, diagram that I will drill into even further. But you start with a lot of ideas. You get a lot of ideas. We've got five companies, and we've got thousands of customers. And each of those customers has thousands of people using our software. And we get ideas all the time. And some of those ideas are brilliant, and some of them are less brilliant. And some of them are um, uh, amazingly new and innovative, and some of them are, are not are less innovative. But we've got a lot of ideas to sort through. We try to refine those into product concepts that we can actually test. And then my team does market validation, prototyping, focus groups, feasibility testing. And we take the ideas from being a, a, a line, you know, bullet point on a PowerPoint to being fully functional prototypes that have been market tested. And then can, we can decide whether to spin them to one of our existing companies, spin them off into a new company. Or, as you have to do when you're doing innovation, kill, kill your baby. So we do kill our ideas. Um, and if you find that you're doing innovation work and you're not killing ideas, you're probably not taking enough risk. This is not working. Doing the market validation, what is, what is the typical time frame that, that you and Lane do for this ballpark? Yeah. So that's a great. That's a great question. We. Um, Can you repeat the question? The, 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 the question is during market validation. How, what's the time frame? Healthcare is hard to validate. It's not. I, I'm envious of my friends who are in the consumer world, who can go to Starbucks or the mall and get immediate feedback on whether or not someone will buy their five dollar app or whatever, and refine their ideas six times in a week. And for us, we need to identify a a partner organization, an enterprise organization that wants to take a risk on some brand new software and validate it. I will get to that a little bit longer, about how we, a little bit later, about some tricks that we've done to speed that up. But in reality, our, um, our innovation cycle process really ends up from being the earliest stage idea to having a full-on validated prototype can be anywhere from eight months to a year. And I think, yeah, OK. I will, I will get to some of this a little bit more. So there's an innovation horizon model. Maybe some of you have heard it. I hope you guys can read in the back. I didn't realize the room would be so big. But um, some of you may be familiar with this. There's three horizons of doing innovate when you talk about innovation. Horizon one is more adjacent. If you've got an existing product, existing market, how are you going to add some features, incremental improvements with your existing customers, your existing markets, <coughs> uh, and that you can commercialize very quickly? That kind of market validation is very quick, because you already have customers, you already have a product. Can we offer this product in Spanish instead of English? Can we add a new button on the front page that is a shortcut to another feature that we want to add? <clears throat> Should we add uh, additional education features in the product? I mean, so those are product, and that's horizon one. And honestly, for a mature company, most of your innovation is going to be in that space, and it's going to be relatively low risk. Horizon 2 is more adjacent. What additional add-on features can I sell to my existing customers that maybe not be core to my product? Uh, what's the next generation product? Maybe a next generation improvement on the existing product, but still maybe satisfying those core needs and those core value propositions. <clears throat> and then uh, Horizon 3 is brand new markets, new business models, new technologies, blue ocean. Just a convenient way to kind of break down where your, where your innovation is. And my team. Uh, tends to focus on the right side of this diagram, Horizon 2, Horizon 3. We, the, the companies themselves all have their own products and their own internal product development, and we leave it to them 
to figure out how to improve the features and functionality and even the next generation of their existing product. Our goal is to do things that are really high risk, high reward, on the edge. So when we come up with new ideas in our system, we have to decide which of those dozens and dozens of ideas we have to pursue. And we've gone through a lot of different methodologies. We ultimately came up with this concept called pipeline filters, where we take our large pipeline and put it through these filters and score them and use them at least some way to rank all the ideas that we're going to pursue. These are, the, these are the filters we use. They will be different for your organization. They will be different for you or how you're going to go after this. So uh, you're welcome to copy these down, obviously. But I, I got these from a larger list that was on online. There's a, uh, let's see, a blog by a guy named Gift Constable um, where he listed like dozens and dozens of these filters. And as a team, we spent several days going through them and testing them and trying to refine this down to just a core group that we use as our evaluation filters. Uh, I, again, they'll be different for every organization deciding on what you think is important. These are, these are the ones that we came up with. We broke it down into five categories. Uh, financial filters, so is the market size large enough that this is worth pursuing? Uh, is the annual revenue potential for this particular idea, if it's fully realized, is it ever going to reach what, what we need it to be to move the needle to make this worth the investment? And then we talk about execution. Are we confident that we can execute on the engineering requirements? Uh, we don't. You know, and this is at the earliest stage when it's just on paper, so you don't exactly know what you're going to be doing. Your idea is going to change multiple times. We'll talk in a minute about how you are 90% certain to be wrong. And you're not being Can you do the last one one more time? Just so you can get it. Got it? Sure. Okay, so uh, um, you, so you, how confident are we that we can, we'll execute on what we think we're going to end up doing? Uh, are we likely to prove our business hypothesis in one year? So not is it going to make you know, revenue positive in one year, not is it going to hit all its targets in one year, but if we have an idea about the value of this product, can we from today to a year from today prove to ourselves and to our leadership that there's a market, that people are going to pay for it, and it's going to be worth what we think it's going to be worth? We have a lot of tricks and tests we can do that don't require actually building out the whole product, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But if it's predicated on some new technology or a new regulatory framework that will be in place for two, three years, we're going to wait and we're going to defer on that. So we kind of want to, we want a year to be sort of, by the end of the year, we want to be able to be sure whether or not we can actually make the money do that. And then we have strategic filters. Do we have a unique competitive advantage? Do we have an unfair advantage? Because when you're in, this, when in the corporate environment in particular, or if you're in a startup, you got competitors everywhere. You want to make sure that you have an unfair advantage. It's just the way it works, because otherwise your competitors are going to have something on you. What's the level of competition and noise already in the market? We don't mind going up against some competitors, but if something, if there's a huge dominant competitor already, that's going to be hard to displace, or if there are dozens of other people with a head start, it may not be the right way, place for us to, to move in. Uh, I, even though we have a lot of resources at our disposal, and you saw that beautiful big building, we've got, you know, that we paid for in cash, so we've got money, but doesn't mean, I still think that uh, a couple guys in the garage can probably, who are not sleeping, working eight, you know, eight days a week, and are eating ramen and putting everything back in the company, have a huge advantage over us. We are, no matter how fast we move, we can't move as fast as that. And uh, how confident are we that this is an important pain point based on our expertise in the healthcare market? And then we have a, some, a team filter. We want to know, are we passionate about the idea? It may be a great idea, but if our team is not excited about it, we maybe want to pass on it hate going into work every day. And then, are we confident that this aligns with where First Health wants to go? So those are, like I said, those are our filters. You're gonna, yours are going to be different. When we, when we embark on pursuing, trying to identify what we do with one idea, we do market research, customer validation, technical feasibility. We, we examine the competitive space. In some cases, we'll do a patent search to see if there's something patent, patentable for us or if we're infringing on a patent. Although, honestly, for a lot of these software products and software business process ideas, the patent search is kind of not really worth the time. And then building a business model, and we use the business model canvas. How many of you are familiar with the business model canvas concept from Austin Waller or a lean startup? Yeah, it's great. It's great for framing your ideas and making sure that you're hitting all the, all the, all the bullet points. You should, if you haven't picked up the book, and there's a book that's like a cartoon book, you should pick that up. And once you know what you're doing, building a business model canvas for a new idea shouldn't take you more than an hour. 
This is not a business plan that you spend six months trying to perfect. This is a business model gambling you spend an hour on. And then you should be able to tear it apart and rebuild it when your ideas realize your ideas are wrong in another hour. So this is not something you invest your life in. This is something to clarify your ideas and figure out where you're going to spend your time. Um, oh, geez. That E got stranded on the bottom. What's the name of that cartoon book? Uh, it's called uh, uh, Biz Biz the Biz Model Canvas, yeah. <laughs> and it's what it's called. It's by a guy named Osterwalder okay. with an O. What? Alexander Osterwalder. And there's two books. There's the Business Model, Can business model Canvas or Business Model Design, and then there's a... No, Lean Canvas, it's very similar. Lean Canvas derived from it. Lean Cam so if you're doing Lean Canvas, that's good. You can see that. And then there's a, uh, a sub subsequent book called Value Proposition Design, which is also great for just trying to think through using that same methodology, putting your customer development up front. Really important to do. Uh, they're great books. They look like, they're, they look like comic books. Uh, I refer back to them all the time. We, we, go, we adhere to this lean development process. I mean, I am a acolyte of Steve Blank and all of the work that he's done. Uh, and uh, his, his, his training materials online are incredibly accessible. And I would encourage you to, if you haven't been exposed to that, I would encourage you to seek them out. Uh, we just, the most simplest uh, refinement of this is that you have an idea. We define what the problems are that our customers are facing. Uh, we design experiments to determine if we're right or wrong. We take these things as hypotheses and not as facts. Uh, we build simple experiments, and we try to do them cheap, and we try to do them uh, uh, reproducibly. And we usually, we make the assumption, like I said earlier, we're wrong. We know we're, we're almost certain we're wrong. far more likely to be wrong than right. And so we build processes, and we build approaches, and we move quickly so that being wrong is not it ends up being a strength, and so that we can cycle through many times through a, through a process. And uh, I mean, it's like, it's like evolution, right? Evolution, you try a lot of different things, and then something succeeds, and natural selection provides for the next generation, and it's thousands or millions of generations before you get to some highly specialized organism. And it's the same with the product. We don't assume from day one that we're right. We assume from day one that we're wrong. We have an idea about what we're right about. We go test it. And then we come back and say, okay, we're wrong about this. Let's make some changes. So we build minimum viable products. This is as defined in the Lean Startup uh, book by uh, Eric Ries. Uh, we do not build what we don't have to. Uh, uh, for instance, we're about to test a product now uh, with a health system in the East Coast. And uh, I won't go into the details about it, but we've built out the core functionality of this product that we think provides the value proposition and almost nothing else. So when we go out and test this product, we're going to have to have human beings sitting with our users, helping them use the system, and you know we've stripped out almost everything that would be. Uh, we're not doing any data, act, you know, data interfacing from the EHRs. We're going to manually enter all that. We're not doing any. Um, we're doing really limited user functionality. We're just the core functionality of a data transfer, matching it up to some guidelines, which we're trying to do. That our system will do but nothing else. And this is not scalable, this isn't gonna be for long term, but we think by the end of a couple days of watching our users interact with the, vet, with the information they're getting and interact with the system, we're gonna learn a ton when we, walk, when we come back. And we'll, we won't have spent very much money, I mean, we'll have spent almost nothing building this. And then, because we know we're wrong, we just don't know which parts of this are wrong, and then we can go back and fix the things that we think are wrong and then test it again. So we build these MVPs, we don't build what we don't have to, we go do our experiment, we measure, we have some metrics we're gonna measure against, and then we listen to everything our customers have to say, and we don't take it all as gospel because the customers don't always know exactly what, you, what they should be, what they would want. I mean, it's that Henry Ford quote, customers want faster horses if you gave them a choice. I don't think Henry Ford really said that. But, <laughs> but you know, so they don't always know exactly, but they, they know what's working for them and what's not working for them. And when we learn, and then we decide to pivot or persevere, and then we refine our processes. It seems really simple. The execution is challenging. It takes, it's taken me about three and a half years to figure out how to do this right, but I feel like I'm getting the hang of it now. And so uh, there was a great article by you know my uh, my hero Steve Blank in uh, the Harvard Business Review about four years ago, which I would encourage you to hunt down, uh, where he talks about how to apply the lean startup approach to uh, to anything you do in the corporate world. And I think this could have you could apply this to being a hospital administrator as much as you could apply this to being at your own startup as much as you can apply this to, to being a product innovator like I am. 
Um, on, the, on the left, you're gonna, you see all the old ways of doing things, and on the right, the new ways that have come, been pioneered all within 20 miles of this, uh, this auditorium. Uh, so I have, I used, when I was a CMIO at my health system, I brought in a project management office, and I built, you know, insisted that we do everything according to the Gantt charts, and we structured everything, we had, you know, sort of very structured product plan, we had plans for how we rolled out features that went six months, and we knew it when everything was gonna happen. And I now have come to realize that, that was a very flawed methodology, because I can't think of a single time when we built out a prolonged project plan on building out some new feature in our EHR or rolling out some new program, I can't think of a single time when our product plan was right. Always wrong. We just never knew where. So there were, um, there were uh, uh, unexpected events, new prioritization, people came and went. So uh, you want to be um, able to, be, to experiment and you want to be able to be agile, focus on agility, focus on being cyclical, uh, focus on being nimble and don't be locked into a plan from day one. And there's a lot of techniques and like at working at agile scrums or applying Kanban methodology. There's, you can train all you want on those things. But um, assume that failure is going to happen and that, that you don't necessarily have to reward failure, but failure is not a reason to give up. Failure is actually an expected outcome and then you just need to learn from that and be able to make it so that the cost of failure is almost nothing. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Mechanical Turk. There we go, the Mechanical Turk. Is it, it, the Mechanical Turk, uh, so you, may, you, you know what this is, but the Mechanical Turk, for those of you who haven't heard of it, was a chess-playing uh, automaton, a robot, uh, I believe in the 17th century, and it traveled throughout Europe, and it defeated chess masters uh, and you know, excellent chess players all over Europe. This is in 17th century. Nobody had ever seen such a thing. It was chess playing robot, right? It was the equivalent of Deep Blue of its era, right? Uh, phenomenal. Uh, well, it turned out that this is how it worked, okay? <laughs> and uh, we, we love this uh, metaphor. Uh, we do this all the time. We, when we, this is how we build our MVPs frequently, which is we come up with our ideas. We have ideas about what provides value to the customer based on extensive customer interviews and customer development and value proposition design. And then, we build a Mechanical Turk experiment where we build out some, some fake, you know, some pretty front end for them to use. And then we did this with a product concept we did last year um, where we, to build this out required, you know, it's going to require about a year or so of some in-depth development rules, building some rules, some NLP functionality, uh, some technical milestones that would have been challenging to hit and would have been expensive to hit. But at the end of doing all that, we still wouldn't understand the business proposition and if pay, people were going to enjoy the features we want and if people wanted to, um, to use those things. So we built a mechanical turbo. We, we put a fake front end in front of the end user and we said, just go ahead, upload your data, put your data in. Our system's a little slow. Our, we're we're going to double check everything. We'll get something back to you in the next day or so. And then we hired a nurse to just do all the work as if she was a computer. Uh, and then we sent that stuff back as if it was done. We said, it's a combination of human and technical methods. And we asked, is this, is this providing value? Is this what you want? Is this, is, does this work for you? And then we immediately got some feedback. Well, this is not the format I want. This is, you know, your, your system is, is pulling things from the wrong section. You know, you're not thinking properly. We're like, great, we can tweak the system. We, did, we could do a dozen experiments in a few weeks instead of spending a year and a half building out a system and then figuring out that we were on the wrong track. So we love this. Technique, it's one of several that you can apply to getting very quick answers without spending a lot of money and a lot of time. All right, five minutes. Okay, so how, what are, what's, what's been the reason why we've been so successful? You know, we've had an innovation uh, lab at Hearst for um, five and a half years. The average length of it, the average tenure of an innovation lab in large, in corporate America is a year and a half. So we're already long in the tooth for core innovation. So why, why have we been successful when others haven't? Uh, it's a, it, there's a couple things. We've been given tremendous autonomy, and this is within the Hearst culture of having lots of individual uh, corporate structure. Uh, we have a dedicated budget that we get to keep and use as we see fit for, for a given year. It's not like we don't have to keep begging for money constantly. And that includes a set aside every year for 
unpredictable expenses or expanding on an idea that has traction. So there's a set aside. We don't have to go find money anytime we can't find something good. At the same time, I try to keep my budget as a rounding error on the first balance sheet. So we try to run, run ourselves as cheaply and, and as effectively as we can with the idea that once we get some validation of our ideas and once we get reduce the risk, we can find more money very easily. The executives are very supportive. The person I report up to is one below the CEO of Hearst, of the whole Hearst Corporation. Uh, we're a private corporation that helps a lot. We are not a public corporation, so we don't have to worry about quarterly stock meeting, stock prices and investor you know, phone calls. Uh, there's a lot of patience. Hearst is 130 years old. They think in terms of decades instead of thinking in terms of quarters. Uh, it's a great brand. We have great companies. We have great resources in our sister companies who have an extensive network of phenomenal customers. So that's been incredibly helpful as an innovator. But it's not all, it's not all you know, without some challenges. And so I do want to mention some challenges. It's tough as the, I think the major thing is, you know, I, recruit, I have some great people on my team uh, and I try to hold on to them and they like to stay for a while, but sometimes it can be challenging because career growth within Hearst, if you want to keep being innovative, and you, but you want to grow to a bigger position, we're a small team, so you'd have to follow either this uh, successful product out or you'd have to go to one of our sister companies. And our sister companies aren't all located in the Bay Area. Not everybody wants to move to Tampa or to uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, <laughs> I don't. Uh, software adoption is slow in healthcare, as we all know. Um, even the most innovative, rapidly moving healthcare uh, enterprise customers, the sales cycle to them for a product could be is on the order of nine months, and that's the fast ones. Uh, it kind of drives me nuts, but that's the reality. Uh, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty, and that was I made this slide before November. Uh, this is a slide of <laughs> it's really bad now. So we really don't understand what's going on <coughs> uh, in Washington, and I don't know when we will. Uh, the lack of interoperability obviously limits the capabilities, limits uh, your ability to execute on the imagination and the ideas that you may have. And the reality is in healthcare, as, in with, as, as with any new idea, but particularly in healthcare, it can be three to five years from an idea to profitability. So you may have a great idea that's been tested, that you think has great value, you've run it against the value, you know, the Camp Turk, you found that people are willing to sign up and pay for it, but to get to profitability is a long time, and even a company like Hearst that has a lot of patience starts to wonder after four or five years. But we'll get there, but it's slow. Uh, it's tough to scale. Uh, we are a, a you know, very nimble, small team, but then we, we, when we do scaling, then we either have to bring in outside people or transfer out to one of our companies, and that's perhaps the subject of another talk one day. Uh, and we, uh, we have to align our incentives with our sister companies. Willie, how much longer do I have? Yeah, so I'm gonna skip ahead here just to, the, to my last slide here, uh, which was William Randolph Hearst, who founded my company, who was, uh, I, I love this quote, you know, and he, he was a phenomenal innovator in his day with what, he's, what he did in, in consumer media. Um, just a fascinating guy if you ever want to read about it or go visit the castle down in, which is now owned by the state of California, so we all own that castle, but, it, <laughs> but uh, um, it, it's amazing to go down there and visit. And what's little known is that that was only one of his castles. There's another one near Mount Shasta that is still owned by his family. I've never been there, but uh, I would love to see that someday. It seems pretty cool. So um, with that, I, I maybe can I take a few questions before we wrap up? Uh, it, the question is, is there any opportunity for innovation to come from the outside into, into my group? And could you, could you be more specific about what you mean by innovation from the outside? Do you look around for other ideas that are outside the company? Well, we'll take ideas any, from anywhere. Uh, and we have even thought about how we would potentially take an external entrepreneur or someone with an external idea and, and try to incubate that idea internally. I've resisted setting us up to compete with the likes of 500 startups or Y Combinator or Techstars or anything like that because you know, I don't think that's our strength. Um, and we have another venue within Hearst for funding startups. We have a venture fund. So 
I'm open to talking about it with folks. Uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of great ideas internally and we have a limited bandwidth with a relatively small team, so it hasn't been an issue, but if you have something you want to bring up and want to talk about, I'm happy to chat about it. Do you think this model of an innovation lab and potentially even a venture arm should exist within hospitals? Yeah, I, I don't know about a venture arm, um, but I, I think you could take these innovation methodologies and apply them in a lot of corporate settings that includes hospitals. But it does require a bit of a change of the culture. You know, health systems are so conservative and they're run on these 1990s era business models and um, they're so afraid of anything that may be perceived as a regulatory risk or, uh, you know, compliance people are crazy about how they're so focused on things. Uh, so if you have a, if, within the organization, if you can find an area where you can carve that out or you can have a very supportive leadership, I think that's great. Uh, and, you know, there, there are examples in this country of organizations that have been able to pull that off and uh, more power to them. I think we need to have more of that. I think... For our healthcare system to truly transform, the transformation is going to have to come up on the delivery end. We haven't seen that, um, and we have to see the incentives change, and that's going to force out some of the old guard who only know how to rack up the fee-for-service you know, dollars and try to find folks who can be innovative in new models. So I'm encouraged by what I see out there, but there's not a lot of it, and, it, and it's challenging, and innovators, I think, I mean, to be honest, I, I was trying to be an innovator in my health system uh, as a CMIO, and I got frustrated, and that was one reason I took this position, which I've thrilled, been thrilled with, but it was tough to innovate in that setting. So I think in the right culture with the right leadership, it's doable. Last question. And I'll be here afterward, too. So. Justin, what about, you, you mentioned your experience with Kaiser. What about this whole innovation going on in Kaiser Station, where you're vertically integrating both the hospital and the labor and professional team? So the, the the question is, what about the innovation that happens in a Kaiser vacation, so a Kaiser-like model, where you have a vertically integrated I mean, they, they delivery network? Be a good fit as a client of what your space would maybe. Sure, yeah. So that's, that's a great question. It's a broad question. So uh, there, you know, there aren't a lot of places that operate the way Kaiser does that are vertically integrated. We're seeing a few more of those, but that model hasn't necessarily expanded more broadly. I don't know, is anybody here a Kaiser physician or on Kaiser? We've got one in Julie, of course. Uh, I have tremendous respect for Kaiser and its mission. I'm actually a Kaiser member. Uh, I don't ever try to do anything innovative at Kaiser because Kaiser, uh, Kaiser is just a, a massive uh, bureaucratic juggernaut. It's very hard to get things off the ground. There's, we can go on and on, but, but uh, I think Kaiser's got a great heart and a great idea and a model, and if we were in a different universe, Kaiser would be the one getting disrupted by small, nimble upstarts who are taking Kaiser's model and ex expanding it. Instead, everyone's trying to just play catch up to Kaiser because they kind of have the right idea, but Kaiser is still you know, a million miles away from where it needs to be in terms of being innovative and uh, uh, agile. So I'd love to see more of those kind of models spring up that we can talk more, there's economic hurdles to why, why Kaiser has been able to expand, for instance, outside of the West. 